This is David Skull, and I bid you welcome to Universal's Dracula. I'm going to spend the next hour and 15 minutes as your tour guide to one of the most influential and yet in many ways underappreciated films in Hollywood history. Introduced by novelist Bram Stoker in 1897, Dracula is one of the most durable fictional creations of modern times. The Universal film, directed by Todd Browning, secured the master vampire's image for the age of mass media. But Bram Stoker himself would barely have recognized most of the Draculas we've known and loved in the 20th century. And therein lies a tale. Along the way, I'm going to discuss the simultaneously produced Spanish-language version, also included on this special edition, and we'll draw extensively from Stoker's original novel, from the stage adaptations, from Universal's final shooting script, as well as earlier scripts and treatments, all to better illuminate the creative processes and creative conflicts that forged the most indelible image of a vampire the world has ever known. The coach rumbling our way is real, even if the mountains aren't. The entire image was captured live in the camera in a single take through an interesting process. I'll explain a bit further on. And here we meet Carla Lemley, the niece of Universal's founder Carl Lemley, delivering the first lines of dialogue ever spoken in a supernatural horror talkie. I should mention that Carla is also the delightful host and narrator of our special documentary supplement, The Road to Dracula, which you can access through the main menu. The word Nosferatu has a special significance in the history of Dracula, which we will explore in due time. And to the Virgin we pray. The peasants are reciting the Lord's Prayer in Hungarian. The signage you will glimpse on the exterior wall of the inn is also in Hungarian. When Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, the region around the Borgo Pass was part of Transylvanian Hungary. Today it's part of Romania, where Dracula tourism is an important part of the local economy. Don't take my luggage down. I'm going on. To Just like Park. Renfield, actor Dwight Fry is very much a stranger in a strange land, having only recently arrived in Hollywood after a successful and varied career as a Broadway actor. And like Renfield, little does he know what he's in for. More about that later. In the film version, Renfield has replaced the novel's journal keeping hero, Jonathan Harker, as the real estate agent who has come to Transylvania to sell Count Dracula a home. The innkeeper is Michael Visserov, a Russian-born and Russian-trained character actor who fled his homeland in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolt. He acted on the New York stage for several years before coming to Hollywood in 1924, at first working for Paramount. Todd Browning used him in a parallel role in 1935's Mark of the Vampire for MGM. He also appeared in the opening sequence of Todd Browning's Freaks in 1932, and in dozens of colorful cameos in major productions such as Morocco, Anna Karenina, and Camille. He was a mainstay and leader of the Russian colony in Hollywood for nearly three decades. In a macabre endnote to his own life and career, Visserov figuratively left his own coffin in 1951, when a New York paper erroneously reported his death. Finding his employment prospects suddenly curtailed, Visserov appealed to the powerful columnist Luella Parsons, who publicly confirmed that reports of the actor's death, like that of Mark Twain, were greatly exaggerated. But just a few weeks later, as Parsons was still contradicting reports of the actor's demise, she received the news that Michael Visseroth actually had died, carried away by a sudden bout of pneumonia. The sun, when it is gone, they leave their coffins. Come, we must go indoors. But wait. I mean, just a minute. What I'm trying to say is that I'm not afraid. Today, of course, Transylvanian innkeepers will do almost anything to encourage travelers to visit the real Dracula's castle, or at least its designated surrogate. Well, good night. Wait, please. If you must go, there it is. 
for your mother's sake. The movies tell us that the crucifix is a most effective vampire repellent, a representation to believers of the true death and resurrection of Christ, as opposed to the blasphemous inversion of the resurrection presented by the vampire. In more recent films and novels, however, vampires are far less likely to cower before the cross. In Universal's 1979 remake, for instance, the dynamic is completely reversed. Not only is Dracula unaffected by the symbol, but the cross itself bursts into flames in Dracula's presence. Cinematographer Karl Freund was a pioneer of the moving camera. In Germany, he had filmed Metropolis for Fritz Lang and The Last Laugh for F.W. Murnau. In Dracula, he seems a bit constrained, perhaps by director Todd Browning, who was traditionally partial to a more static camera, and tracking shots like this appear only sporadically. Coming up is the first supernatural vampire ever depicted in Hollywood, actress Geraldine Dvorak, formerly Greta Garbo's stand at MGM. And here, in an unforgettable shot, the 1931 public first met Count Dracula in the person of Bela Lugosi. He seems to pull us toward him, each audience member a potential victim. You'll notice that that shot was oddly off-center. This is the result of the original full aperture image being masked on one side to make room for the optical soundtrack. This next scene is highly atmospheric, but it does present a puzzle. In the novel, the Spanish film version, and the antecedent film, Nosferatu, Dracula's face is completely muffled. It's incomprehensible that Renfield later fails to recognize the driver at the castle. The shooting script calls explicitly for Dracula to be, quote, almost completely hidden in the folds of his great cloak, and has a hat pulled down over his face so that nothing of him is visible, save a pair of bright, almost feverish eyes. Unquote. The Borgo Pass is a real location, but not a place Stoker or his adapters had actually visited. In reality, it's a lushly forested region, but both the novelist and the filmmakers wanted something a tad more atmospheric. The coat from Count Dracula? From the shooting script, quote, There are queer, grotesque-looking trees with twisted black branches, huge misshapen rocks that in the moonlight seem to take on fantastic shapes. The whole area through which the coach is passing has a grim, macabre quality, as if taken bodily from a doré steel engraving. As discussed in our documentary supplement, upcoming is an effect known as a glass shot. The upper portion of the image is painted on a piece of glass mounted in front of the camera, and photographed simultaneously with the live action. The coach and rocky roadbed are live, and the rest of the image is a carefully crafted optical illusion. The actual geological formations in the lower part of the picture can still be visited at Vasquez Rocks Park in the Antelope Valley north of Los Angeles. The horses being led by a bat was the invention of screenwriter Fritz Stefani, who imagined the scene in Universal's earliest treatment for Dracula, dated June 1930. going at this. Renfield's cautious approach to the door of Castle Dracula is emblematic of Hollywood's attitude toward Dracula himself. Although the stage play had earned more than two million dollars in America alone, the studios were as much repelled as attracted by the grotesque, frankly fantastic character and subject matter. But once Renfield had crossed Dracula's cobwebby threshold, fantastic and uncanny themes would no longer be taboo in the American cinema. A virtual land rush would follow at Universal and other studios, with Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Mummy, and so many others. This extraordinary set, magnified to soaring heights with another glass painting, was constructed on Universal Stage 12, a facility still in use today. The 18-foot-wide spider web was constructed on a wire framework, built up with filaments of rubber cement shot out of a rotary gun, rather like cotton candy. Dracula's first appearance is much more theatrically realized in the Spanish version. But the simplicity of Bram Stoker's original introduction of the Count is also worth consideration. Quote, I heard a heavy step approaching from beyond the great door, and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. 
Then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. A key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse, and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven save for a long white mustache, and clad in black from head to foot, without a single speck of color about him anywhere. I am Dracula. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. He made no motion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue, as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone. Well, and with all this, I, I thought I was in the wrong place. I bid you welcome. The instant, however, that I had stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward, and holding out his hand, grasped mine with a strength that made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice, more like the hand of a dead than a living man. Listen to them, children of the night. What music they make. It has become fashionable in recent adaptations of Dracula to modify this famous line to what sad music they make or what sweet music they make, but Lugosi intones it with just the note of malevolent ambiguity that Stoker originally intended. Today, of course, Dracula would probably have walked straight through the spider web with the aid of some digital effect, but consider how much more chilling it is not to see the action. Prompted by what is unseen, we complete the uncanny event in our own minds. As shot, Dracula's following line originally began, quote, The eternal struggle for life. Each living creature must have blood to live. The spider spinning his web for the unwary fly. The blood is the life, Mr. Redfield. I, uh... uh yes. Dracula is quoting from Deuteronomy 1223, an injunction against consuming blood, one of many explicit and implicit biblical references in Stoker. I'm sure you will find this part of my castle more inviting. Well, rather. The sound technicians apparently didn't find Dracula's chambers hospitable in the least. According to studio publicity, this scene had to be delayed for hours at considerable expense until the loud crackling of the fire logs died down. Thank you. That's very kind of you. But I'm a bit worried about my luggage. You see, all your papers were in... Bela Lugosi, whose real name was Bela Blaschko, was born in Lugos, Hungary in 1882. He became fascinated with the theater at an early age, much to the disappointment of his parents, and worked extensively in provincial productions, and finally secured a company position with the National Theater in Budapest. Contrary to some accounts, he played mostly supporting and minor roles at the National Theater, a source of endless frustration for him. Post-war political upheaval and his activities as a union organizer forced him to flee his homeland in 1919. He worked briefly in German films before coming to the United States in 1920 to look for more rewarding work as a stage actor. He learned many of his English-language roles phonetically, resulting in the deliberate, oddly inflected diction we now forever associate with Count Dracula. Curiously, this is another characteristic at odds with Stoker's vampire, who took great pains to speak English without any trace of an accent. You may have noticed a continuity jump as Renfield's valise suddenly leapt from Dracula's hands flat onto the table. For some reason, Dracula's inquiry as to whether Renfield has destroyed all his correspondence has been cut, resulting in an abrupt edit. Another line, cut from an earlier script, would have revealed Renfield as the sole proprietor of his real estate practice, and therefore unlikely to be missed in the event of his disappearance. Well, here. Here's the lease. Oh, I, uh, I hope I've brought enough labels for your luggage. I'm taking with me only three, uh, boxes. In the novel, Dracula takes no chances. He packs... 50 wooden boxes with his native soil. I have chartered a ship to take us to England. Here are some more of Stoker's original descriptions of the Count. Quote, his face was a strong, a very strong aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the face and temples, but profusely elsewhere. 
His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that curled in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. End quote. Stoker's Dracula also has pointed ears, pointed fingernails, hair growing in his palms, and bad breath to boot. The action of the finger-cutting sequence is taken directly from F. W. Murnau's 1922 German film Nosferatu, an unauthorized adaptation of Dracula, which Universal's personnel studied closely. The editing of the sequence reveals another continuity jump. Renfield's bed is suddenly turned down, although Dracula has not had the time to perform the courtesy. This is very old wine. One of the most famous lines from Dracula is not taken from the novel or the stage play, but is original to the Universal film. When the play was revived on Broadway in 1977, the line was added to the script, presumably because audiences have come to expect it. You drinking? I never drink. Why? Notice how many religious images have come together in this short scene. The church-like architecture, Dracula's ritualistic demeanor before an altar-like table, the partaking of bread, wine, and blood, the display of a crucifix. And now I'll leave you. A very unusual, nearly 180-degree camera move. Incidentally, this is not the first time Dwight Fry had acted with Bela Lugosi. They had previously appeared together, along with Frederick March, in the Broadway comedy The Devil in the Cheese in 1926. But after Dracula, both Lugosi and Fry would find comedy roles few and far between. The novel Dracula is full of Shakespearean allusions, and Dracula's three wives, as imagined by Stoker, are likely inspired by the weird sisters in Macbeth. In addition to Geraldine Dvorak, the other actresses are Dorothy Tree and Cornelia Thaw, whose real name was Mildred Pierce. Another continuity lapse here. According to the script, Renfield makes the fatal mistake of removing the crucifix from his neck, an action explicit in the Spanish version. Here, the shot, if filmed, seems to have been deleted. In both the approved shooting script and in the Spanish version, Renfield is attacked by Dracula's wives and not by Dracula himself. In one of the later versions of the script, though not the shooting script, a wonderful effect is proposed, that the camera be placed on the floor in Renfield's helpless position as the ghostly faces of the women descend upon him. The vision of Dracula repelling the vampire women and claiming the male visitor for himself is one of the earliest images that fired Bram Stoker's imagination. It brings to completion the uneasy atmosphere of homoerotic seduction that has colored the entire sequence. In Bram Stoker's own theatrical adaptation, which he presented as a staged reading in 1897, Dracula goes so far as to sweep the unconscious English visitor up into his arms and carry him away into the shadows, much like Rhett Butler's rape of Scarlett O'Hara. In the modernized stage play upon which the film is largely based, Dracula makes his risky journey to England in an aeroplane, leaving Transylvania at dusk and arriving at Wimbledon Aerodrome before dawn. Screenwriter Fritz Stefani had suggested that the plane itself have wings shaped like those of a bat. This approach was wisely avoided. Due to mounting budget constraints, the sequence was constructed largely from footage taken from a universal silent called the Stormbreaker. The jerky, speeded-up appearance of the film is the result of silence being shot and projected at a slower speed than talkies. Like Renfield and because of Renfield, Dwight Fry himself would soon be transformed into a lunatic, at least from the standpoint of Hollywood casting directors, who, after Dracula, had little use for Fry's demonstrated versatility as a Broadway character actor. Also in 1931, James Whale cast him in another demented role, that of the hunchbacked laboratory assistant Fritz in Frankenstein. Thereafter, Fry found himself in a very narrow career groove, but luckily for film fans, he gave some of the most unforgettably enjoyable performances in the entire Universal canon. Had this scene followed the script and not been cobbled together from stock footage, we would have been treated to the following. Quote, large close-up, Dracula, fangs bared. Medium shot, sailor, vaulting over the rail into the sea. Close-ups ad-lib, to be worked out in detail later, ending with a huge and impressive shot of Dracula, 
arms upraised, dark cloak billowing in the gale, about to close in on a screaming, helpless wretch he has cornered. Here now, here now, get back. Nobody goes aboard this here boat with the authority. Captain dead, tied to the wheel. The voice of the harbor master is that of Dracula's director, Todd Browning. Born Charles Albert Browning in Louisville, Kentucky in 1880, Browning got his start in show business via traveling carnivals and freak shows, for which he maintained a morbid fascination long after he became one of the highest-paid directors in Hollywood. Browning's films are filled with outsiders and misfits and disturbing images of physical deformity. He forged a winning partnership in the 1920s with Lon Chaney, the famous man of a thousand faces, who was similarly drawn to themes of mutilation and disability. Universal hoped to have Cheney work with Browning on Dracula, where the actor's spectacular skill as a makeup artist would likely have created a Dracula very much unlike the one we've come to know. But Cheney was stricken with terminal cancer before a contract could be finalized. This legendary shot was not scripted and presumably was the result of an inspired improvisation between Fry, Browning, and Freund. Fry's son, also named Dwight, told me that he is still startled from time to time by waiters and salespeople who, recognizing his name on a credit card, spontaneously regale him with imitations of his father's otherwise inimitable laugh. The inclusion of this newspaper is the film's closest echo of Stoker's use of accumulated documents to tell his story, journals, diaries, letters, and clippings. Stoker modeled his shipwreck on an actual maritime disaster and probably got the idea of a vampire arriving in England on a storm-tossed ship from an 1847 Penny Dreadful novel called Varney the Vampire. The sound of traffic is the first inkling we have that we are watching a film set in the 20th century. An interesting bit of scripted action was cut here, though possibly shot. There is no parallel scene in the Spanish version. Quote, he nods slowly, indicating that he'll take a flower, and makes a sign that she is to place it in his buttonhole. She selects a flower and with a half-timid, half-coquettish air, starts to obey. Camera moves forward to a large close-up of her face as her eyes start to move around in a dizzy, circular movement under the spell of Dracula's hypnotic stare. The approved shooting script also described Dracula parting his lips to reveal fang-like teeth. I'm virtually certain the flower girl was played by a young actress named Anita Dardorf, who did not much longer pursue a Hollywood career, but later, under her married name, Anita Harder, was active in Santa Barbara Community Theater, where she enjoyed recounting her appearance as Bela Lugosi's first victim outside Transylvania. The script has an evocative description here of a moving camera shot worthy of Carl Freund that was never quite realized. Through dense fog, which starts slowly to clear, brilliant lights appear and the crowd becomes denser. We see men in top hats and the gleam of white shoulders, the richness of furs. Music was used sparingly in early talkies, and it was often limited to title sequences and scenes in which music was actually being performed. We just heard a snippet of Schubert's unfinished symphony, followed rather abruptly by the prelude to Wagner's Der Meistersinger. The film's opening title music is from Act Two of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, which became a kind of trademark for Universal's early horror films. It also opens Murders in the Rue Morgue and The Mummy. And here we meet the rest of the principal supporting cast. From left to right, Helen Chandler as Mina Seward, David Manners as John Harker, Herbert Bunston as Dr. Seward, and Francis Dade as Lucy Weston. And after... Dracula movies tend to be very class conscious. The aristocratic vampire invariably dominates and controls an assortment of working class characters, maids, nurses, and other economically subservient women. By 1931, the Depression had drawn very sharp lines between the world's haves and have-nots, and perhaps this accounts for some of the film's fascination for audiences of the period. Put on the telephone. Oh, thank you. Well, excuse me, Oh, yes. Father, hmm? if it's from home, will you say I'm spending the night in town with Lucy? <laughs> All right, dear. <laughs> Pardon? Mm. Yes? It is very puzzling how Carl Freund could have set up such a badly composed shot with Dracula standing outside and below the box. It was probably this shot that led one Cleveland reviewer to conclude in print that Lugosi must be an actor of very short stature. I understand. It adjoins your grounds. Why, yes, it does. 
I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. Uh, may I present um, my daughter, Mina? Count Dracula. All three of the young performers, Helen Chandler, David Manners, and Francis Dade, had only brief careers in Hollywood, and all for very different reasons. How do you do? Count Dracula's just taken Carfax Abbey. Oh, well, in Stoker's yeah. novel and the stage adaptations, Carfax is only a house, but in the Universal film it becomes for the first time an abbey. It is a stand-in, obviously, for Whitby Abbey, an actual ruin on the North Yorkshire coast that Stoker knew well and features prominently in the first portion of his novel. It reminds me of the broken battlements of my own castle in Transylvania. The Abbey always reminds Francis Dade came from a prominent Philadelphia family, acted in stock and toured with the stage production of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in the late 20s, before her short fling with Hollywood. Her first film was Raffles with Ronald Coleman. In one of the later script drafts, this exchange with Dracula takes place at Lucy's home, where she has just given a harp recital. Frances Dade returned to Philadelphia in the mid-30s, married, and at the time of her death in the 1960s, was reported to have been working as a nurse. Be really dead. That must be glorious. Why, Count Dracula? There are far worse things, waiting man, than death. Here's a curious landmark moment as Helen Chandler gives the first vocal imitation of Bela Lugosi as Dracula on record. It reminds me of the broken battlements of my own castle in Transylvania. No one dreamed at the time that Lugosi's voice would become one of the most imitated and instantly recognizable in Hollywood history. I think he's fascinating. In real life, Chandler and Dade were the closest of friends. Chandler had been acting professionally from the age of eight and had an impressive list of stage credits in New York. She had played one of the young princes in John Barrymore's Richard III and appeared as Ophelia in Horace Livwright's innovative modern dress production of Hamlet. Just prior to Dracula, she appeared in the screen adaptation of Sutton Vane's drama Outward Bound, about a ship whose passengers don't yet realize they're dead and sailing toward judgment. Chandler seemed to have quite a promising career ahead of her, but she also had her own private vampire, alcohol, which would very soon begin to destroy her personally and professionally. An alternate take of this shot with Lugosi, along with many others, can be seen in the Spanish version, where they were used as a cost-cutting measure. Although bats have long been associated with the supernatural, Bram Stoker was the first writer to suggest a human vampire's literal transformation into a vampire bat. The association of vampires with werewolf transformations, however, had long been established in folklore and literature. Here is how the scene was originally described before being toned down somewhat for the shooting script. Quote, she has given up reading and is lying back, her eyes closed as if dreaming of something. A slight smile plays upon her lips. She breathes evenly, and as her head lies back on the pillow, we see her beautiful white throat and a suggestion of her well-formed bosom. And moments later, as Dracula approaches for the kill, quote, his lips part and his head bends nearer to her throat. The teeth seem to have an almost canine appearance as his mouth is about to touch her neck, unquote. The Spanish film also avoids fangs, but more effectively ends the scene with Dracula pulling his cape over his sleeping victim like a shroud. In the novel, Lucy took weeks to die. In Hollywood, Dracula worked much more efficiently. Dead. Dr. Seward, when did Miss Weston have the last transfusion? About four hours ago. An unnatural loss of blood, which we've been powerless to check.
on the throat of each victim, the same two marks. More moving camera work from Carl Freund, this shot accomplished with a hydraulic crane also used by cinematographer George Robinson for the dramatic staircase appearance of Dracula in the Spanish version. The ward attendant is Charles Gerard, an actor who had appeared the previous year, along with David Manners, in the film version of R.C. Sheriff's acclaimed World War I drama, Journey's End. The director, James Whale, would soon be recruited by Universal, where he would quickly eclipse Todd Browning, with an incomparable flair for films like Frankenstein, The Old Dark House, and The Invisible Man. Browning never seemed entirely comfortable with talkies or with directing dialogue, whereas Whale had the advantage of being an experienced stage director at a time when Hollywood was actively recruiting new talent from the theater. All right. Have it your own way. And here we are introduced to the unorthodox scientist, Professor Van Helsing, played by the character actor Edward Van Sloan. Like Lugosi, Van Sloan created this part in the original Broadway production. The producers had seen him portray an Austrian psychiatrist in a drama by Franz Werfel and thought he would be perfect for the part. Van Sloan told a reporter that he had never performed in a play that ran more than a few weeks, but the New York and Roadshow versions of Dracula kept him occupied for 22 months. Dealing with the undead. Mas. Yes, Nosferatu. Nosferatu is a word Stoker found in a book by the Scottish-born folklorist Emily Gerard called The Land Beyond the Forest, the literal meaning, by the way, of the word Transylvania. Gerard mentioned that Nosferatu was the Romanian term for vampire, and Stoker took her word for it. He used the word authoritatively in his novel, and it was further popularized as the title of F.W. Murnau's unauthorized film adaptation of 1922. The problem is, the word Nosferatu cannot be found in any dictionary or lexicon, Romanian or otherwise. Its real meaning and derivation, therefore, are still matters of conjecture and mystery. Dr. Seward is played by Herbert Bunston, who reprises his Broadway role. Born in England, Bunston made his London stage debut in 1897, coincidentally the year of Dracula's first publication. He's the only person connected with the 1931 film who also had a professional connection with Bram Stoker, who was still acting as general manager of Sir Henry Irving's Royal Lyceum Theatre when Bunston performed there at the turn of the century. Bunston died in 1935. Beginning with this scene, the pacing of the film slows considerably. So, as Dr. Seward and Professor Van Helsing discuss vampire superstition, I'd like to give a more complete outline of the genesis of Stoker's novel in folklore and literature, and its transformations by way of the theater that resulted in the classic film we are now watching. Legends of spirits who return from the dead to drain the blood or energy of the living are as old as recorded history. It is Eastern European folklore that most informs Dracula, but the image of the vampire as a decadent, predatory aristocrat is not part of the folklore tradition at all. Rather, it derives from romantic literature, in particular a short story called The Vampire by John Polidori, published in 1819. Polidori was the physician and traveling companion of Lord Byron, whose scandalous personal life was taken to be the inspiration for Polidori's supernatural lady killer, Lord Rubin. Polidori's story inspired at least seven stage adaptations and two operas in the 19th century, and their influence on Dracula is considerable. Novelist Bram Stoker was born just outside of Dublin in 1847. He was a very sickly child, and one can't read about his early life without being reminded of all the anxious sickbed scenes in Dracula. Stoker overcame childhood illness, attended Trinity College, and afterward became a civil servant. But his real passion was the theater, and while working as an unpaid drama critic for a Dublin paper, met a rising English actor-manager named Henry Irving. Stoker was overwhelmed with Irving's charisma, and shortly thereafter devoted his professional life for the next three decades to managing Irving's company and its base of operations, the Lyceum Theatre. 
Almost all commentators on Stoker have noted his slavish devotion to Irving, a relationship that virtually eclipsed his own marriage. Given the fact that Stoker was publishing voluminous amounts of popular fiction on the side, it is difficult to imagine what time for a domestic or personal life he had at all. One is tempted to find an echo of his professional bondage in Dracula, the Lyceum as the castle, and Henry Irving as the count, Stoker as the imprisoned Jonathan Harker. In fact, Stoker sorely wanted Henry Irving to play Dracula on the Lyceum stage. Like Polidori, Stoker also seems to have intended his vampire as a backhanded tribute to a difficult, controlling benefactor. He spent nearly six years researching, writing, and revising Dracula, apparently in the hope of achieving a creative collaboration with Irving, not just a business partnership. In our documentary supplement, you can see Stoker's original working notes for Dracula, as well as some photos of Henry Irving. Irving, however, spurned Stoker's efforts to recruit him as a vampire. A Chicago drama critic recalled Stoker's complaints during one of Irving's American tours. Quote, When the late Bram Stoker told me he had put endless hours in trying to persuade Henry Irving to have a play made from Dracula and act in it, he added that he had nothing in mind save the box office. If, he explained, I am able to afford to have my name on the book, the governor can certainly afford, with business bad, to have his name on the play. But he laughs at me whenever I talk about it, and then we have to go out and raise money to put on something in which the public has no interest. End quote. Stoker went on to describe Irving as Dracula as a composite of the actor's celebrated villains, Mephistopheles in Faust, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, and many others. In his earliest outlines, Stoker actually structured his story in the manner of a Shakespearean play in five acts, or books as he called them. The vampire's name was originally Count Vampyr, until Stoker came across a reference to the ferocious 15th-century warlord named Vlad Tepish, popularly known as Dracula, meaning son of the devil. Although Stoker did very little research into the historical Dracula, appropriating the name was one of his greatest inspirations. Back, Back to the film for a scene or two. There is some controversy about the degree of director Todd Browning's control over the film. Cast member David Manners told me personally that Browning directed none of his scenes, that the production was very disorganized, and that his only direction came from cameraman Carl Freund. Master, don't, please. Please. Oh, don't. Freund himself must have been very distracted with additional responsibilities for the scene coming up. Notice the very ragged piece of cardboard some grip has obviously used to shield a practical lamp for a close-up. Notice how it never goes away, even for the long shots. One gets the feeling no one is in the director's chair or behind the viewfinder. In fairness to Browning, even a more polished director like James Whale was capable of things just as sloppy. In our special edition of Frankenstein, check out the operating table shot where a sheet has fallen off the monster's draped form revealing someone's neatly polished dress shoe. But back to Dracula. At the time Helen Chandler made this film, she was married to screenwriter Cyril Hume, who would eventually write the science fiction classic Forbidden Planet. The marriage failed quickly, and Chandler next married the actor Bramwell Fletcher, best remembered by Universal Horror fans as the young archaeologist who goes out of his mind after accidentally reviving Boris Karloff in The Mummy. This marriage also crumbled as the actress began a self-destructive spiral of drink, drugs, and periodic commitments to sanitariums. By 1935, her film career was essentially over. She fell out of public view until 1950 when, heavily sedated with sleeping pills, she was badly burned in a Hollywood bedroom fire, bringing a flurry of lurid press attention. The world never heard from her again. She died in 1965 following surgery for massively bleeding ulcers. She was cremated, but her ashes were never claimed. I felt so weak. It seemed as if all the life had been drained out of me. Darling. The novel Dracula was a departure from previous vampire stories, plays, and operas, in that Stoker made no attempt to romanticize Dracula. And our 20th century image of the Count is a hybrid of Stoker's character and vampires from other literary sources. Stoker's Dracula engenders disgust rather than attraction, and is an amalgam of qualities that late Victorian England found repulsive and unsavory. There was a strong current of cultural xenophobia in the 1890s, and many Britons felt threatened by waves of immigration. Foreigners were frequently viewed as a threat to cultural and racial purity, 
and demonized as biologically degenerate, according to a very distorted understanding of the theories of Charles Darwin. Dracula himself is a perfectly Darwinian monster, changing shape up and down the evolutionary scale. He is an invading foreigner with a strong anti-Semitic coloration, much like Shylock, Fagin, or Svengali. How long have you had those little marks? Marks? Please. Examination of the skin for telltale marks was a common anxiety ritual for sexually active Victorians. Bram Stoker may have been less familiar with the phrase, the blood is the life, as a biblical passage than as an advertising tagline for a quack remedy for quote-unquote bad blood, a euphemism for syphilis. Some scholars argue that Stoker himself may have suffered from tertiary syphilis, then untreatable, which could have hastened his death in 1912. It's good to see you back again. The novel offers many strange reflections of other Victorian sexual anxieties as well. Many Victorian men were disturbed by the growing assertiveness of women. The concept of the quote-unquote new woman was routinely mocked and vilified in the mainstream press as monstrous and degenerate. In Dracula, the awakening of women's sexuality is presented as a kind of evolutionary throwback linked to blood contamination by a foreigner. The lusty vampire women in Dracula are in many ways caricatures of Victorian prostitutes who were popularly scapegoated as vectors of venereal disease and the destruction of the middle-class family. Scientists, whose name we know, even in the wild of Transylvania. Dracula's first two screen appearances were not authorized by Stoker's widow. The first, in fact, probably escaped her notice. Dracula's death, directed in Hungary by Karoli Leipai in 1921, concerned a musician committed to an insane asylum who believes he is the immortal vampire. He makes the fatal mistake of inviting someone to fire a bullet at him, hoping to prove his immortality. Dracula's death only used the character's name, but the following year in Germany, F.W. Murnau directly adapted Stoker's novel as Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, featuring a Dracula even more repulsive than anything Stoker envisioned, half-human and half-rat. Although Nosferatu disguised the character names, Bram Stoker's widow was able to convince the German courts to declare the film a plagiarism and order all prints destroyed. Fortunately for film history, several copies did survive, and Nosferatu is now considered an expressionist classic. As your father advises. Very well. The scene with the mirror originated in Stoker's novel when Jonathan Harker, interrupted by Dracula while shaving, cannot see the Count's reflection in his shaving glass. The vampire, of course, reacts violently. In the Dean Balderston stage version, Van Helsing makes the discovery in a wall-hung mirror, which Dracula shatters with a vase. In Dean's earlier stage version, apparently as a budgetary measure, Dracula only started to hurl the vase but then thought better, saving his producer the cost of replacing an expensive prop for every performance. Why is it for so ill time? Not at all. On the contrary, it may prove to be most enlightening. In fact, before you go, you can be of definite service. Anything I can do, gladly. Mirrors traditionally have many deep connections with the supernatural. After all, mirror reflections split us into two aspects, and the double has always been associated with the dark side of human nature, the side we don't want reflected. I mistrust my own judgment. Look. In the Spanish version, Dracula intensifies the mirror smashing by the use of his cane. Although we now regard Dracula as a quintessential screen icon, the modern Dracula image is in fact largely a creation of the legitimate theater. When Hamilton Dean wrote and produced the first authorized stage version in 1924, he introduced a radically reconstituted Dracula, a suave man about town who actively ingratiates himself into the lives of the other characters. For one who has not lived even a single lifetime, you are a wise man, Ben Helsing. Dean added the continental accent that Stoker's Dracula had worked so hard to overcome, as well as the now trademark evening clothes and satin-lined cape, trappings borrowed from the familiar, faintly Mephistophelian persona of the standard stage magician. 
Dean originally planned to play Dracula himself, but soon realized that Van Helsing had all the good speeches, so he took the role of the professor. Oh. He was afraid we might follow Father. Beyond giving Dracula some manners and a new wardrobe, Dean completely eliminated Stoker's Transylvania scenes and restructured the whole story as an economical modern drawing room mystery melodrama that could utilize stock scenery and also not require the expense of period costumes. Dean's play toured the British provinces for three years before taking up residence at the Little Theatre, a well-known haunt for horror and mystery plays in London's West End. As a publicity stunt, audiences were greeted by a registered nurse in the lobby, on hand to administer smelling salts to the faint of heart. The public loved it, but the snootier London critics were not kind and reserved special brickbats for the play's more mechanical contrivances. From the Daily Telegraph, quote, if you shout loudly or strangely enough, and if only you can contrive to make the sound unexpected, somebody is sure to be terrified. In that sense, at least, this piece displays a sure sense of the theater. There is very little of Bram Stoker in it. But most of us jumped in our seats at least once in every act. End quote. Dean's play was more than a little hammy, but it was noticeable for introducing so many of the standard fixtures we now associate with Dracula. Swirling capes, swirling mists, French windows, secret panels, and perhaps most memorably, easily hypnotizable maids who can be relied upon to remove a variety of annoyances, ranging from crucifixes to garlic flowers to noxious necklaces of vampire-repelling wolfbane. The American stage rights were secured by the publisher-producer Horace Livwright, a flamboyant showman ever on the prowl for sensational properties. Rewritten for Broadway by playwright journalist John L. Balderston, Dracula opened in New York in October 1927. When the West End Dracula, Raymond Huntley, turned down the Broadway part in a salary dispute, Livwright, unable to afford a name performer, offered the role to the relatively unknown Hungarian expatriate actor Bela Lugosi. Despite Lugosi's shaky command of English, Balderston recalled that Lugosi finally had to be directed in French as a compromise, Lugosi was an imposing presence in the part. Livwright insisted on adding touches of sickly eroticism. Lugosi wore bilious green makeup as he bestowed a languorous kiss before bearing his victim's throat for the main course. In the film, any suggestion of vampire foreplay is completely eliminated. As in London, lobby nurses and fainting patrons were both provided by the management. A conflict of interest, perhaps, but one which drew no serious complaint. Hollywood studios had long toyed with the idea of filming Dracula, but were put off by the horrifying subject matter, and many studio readers considered it completely unfilmable for reasons of censorship. I'm going to say anything. I told him nothing. I'm loyal to you, master. What have you to do with Dracula? Dracula? Dwight Fry may well have regretted ever having heard the name Dracula, given the effect it had on his career though the roles he was offered after Dracula and Frankenstein may have been beneath his real talents. He gave wonderfully loony performances in such films as The Vampire Bat, Bride of Frankenstein, and Dead Men Walk. A devout Christian scientist who hid a serious heart condition from his friends and family, he died on a Los Angeles public bus in 1943. The Maid, played by Moon Carroll, is misidentified on the film's main titles as Joan Standing. Standing actually plays the nurse Briggs, who will soon attend the ailing Mina. <laughs> this creepy scene of Renfield crawling toward the maid is not what it seems to be. For some reason, the scene ends prematurely, and what happens to the maid is never explained. For the surprising answer to this mystery, refer to the parallel scene in the Spanish version. When Dracula made its debut on Broadway in October 1927, Universal sent a representative, Carrington North, to the opening night performance. He filed the following evaluation. Quote, so far as the picture value of the story goes, nothing has changed. Dracula is and always has been material for a great picture. Great an opportunity for actors, writers, and director. Great opportunity for photography of a wonderful sort in nature. But while it is picture material from the angle of the pictorial and dramatic, it is not picture material from the standpoint of the box office nor of ethics of the industry. It would be a thing which no child, 
and for that matter, no adult of delicate nervous temperament should see a thing beside which the cabinet of Dr. Caligari would seem like a pleasant fireside reverie, end quote. Dracula ran for 33 weeks on Broadway, followed by two simultaneous American tours, one with Bela Lugosi and the other with Raymond Huntley, the original London Dracula. Lugosi luckily played the part in Los Angeles, home of the film industry. Studio executives who were afraid of the novel realized that the much tamer thrills of the stage play might be screenworthy after all. Following two years of often tempestuous negotiations between Bram Stoker's widow, Hamilton Dean, John L. Balderston and their agents, and the studios of Universal, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Columbia, and Fox Films, Universal finally purchased the film rights to the novel and stage adaptations for $40,000 in the summer of 1930. The scene we're now watching shows another puzzling lapse of directorial judgment, or perhaps just pressure from the front office to keep the production moving. The shot runs nearly four minutes without a cut. When David Manners returns, he will have almost nothing to do but stare blankly at Helen Chandler, waiting in vain for a close-up or reaction shot that never arrives. I had the great pleasure of making David's acquaintance during the last years of his life, and I remember him telling me how much he disliked film acting as opposed to the stage. He complained that the studios treated actors like mechanical props instead of artists. He was annoyed at being given chalk marks on the floor for positioning and hated filming scripts out of sequence. As a Broadway actor, he felt the performer controlled the dramatic moment, but in Hollywood, actors sometimes weren't even told what was going on. Although it's not apparent on screen, in the days of slow film stocks, sets like this had to be lit with enormous arc lights which could be blindingly painful for the actors, especially when shooting was going slowly as it did on Dracula. David Manor's real name was Ralph Acklam. He was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1901, began a stage career in the 1920s before switching to film. The year before Dracula, he appeared in seven pictures, including Journey's End, directed by James Whale. He is also well remembered for his appearances in other universal horror and mystery classics, including The Mummy, The Black Cat, and The Mystery of Edwin Drood. His six unhappy years in Hollywood came to an end, he told me, when Joan Crawford hysterically screamed obscenities at him for having the temerity to turn down a script. He told me he simply knelt down, placed the script silently at the screaming Crawford's feet, and left, never looking back. After retiring from Hollywood, he ran a guest ranch in the California desert, published a few novels, and in his later years devoted his life to spiritual pursuits, and well into his 90s published a periodic newsletter of metaphysical reflections. He died in 1998 at the age of 97. Bela Lugosi was not the studio's first choice for Dracula. Trade papers had suggested the Austrian actor Conrad Veidt, who had played the vampire-like sleepwalker in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but Universal's president, Carl Lemley, insisted that the part be played by silent superstar Lon Chaney, whose fame for grotesque characterizations would provide box office insurance for the risky property. Chaney had proven himself difficult and temperamental for Universal in the past, but his films did make money. Negotiations got as far as Universal's offer of a three-picture deal, including a talking sequel to The Phantom of the Opera, but Chaney had already developed terminal cancer. His death in August 1930, at the age of 47, shocked the film world. Universal had already convinced Todd Browning, Chaney's director at MGM, to helm Dracula, and considered a flurry of other actors for the lead role. Paul Muni was screen-tested. His multiple characterizations in the film Seven Faces had briefly typed him as a possible heir to the mantle of the Man of a Thousand Faces. William Courtenay, Ian Keith, and Chester Morris were also considered. Bela Lugosi had lobbied feverishly for the screen part, even corresponded with Bram Stoker's widow in an attempt to bring down the purchase price. But the studio expressed little interest in the actor until all other possibilities had fallen through. Because he was not an established film star, the studio felt confident that Lugosi could be signed fairly cheaply, and they were right. He begrudgingly accepted a take-it-or-leave-it offer of $500 a week for seven weeks of filming. It was a quarter of the salary commanded by David Manners as the lackluster juvenile lead. But Lugosi had succeeded against all odds in making the screen part his own, and the studio did in fact bill him as the new Lon Chaney. A number of screenwriters worked on Dracula. Following the previously discussed Fritz Stefani was the Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist Louis Bromfield, who faithfully adapted Stoker's opening and closing sequences in Transylvania, cleverly reconciling discrepancies with the stage play by having Stoker's withered old man rejuvenate through blood drinking into the suave, younger Dracula popularized in the theater. 
Carl Lemley Jr., who produced Dracula, had originally hoped for the project to be a lavish super production, as Universal's A pictures were then known. However, Bromfield's ambitious panoramic adaptation would have bankrupted the studio. Virtually nothing remains of it in the final production. Dudley Murphy, followed by Garrett Fort, completely reworked the script, adding all its famous set pieces, as well as Dracula's morbidly memorable dialogue. Director Todd Browning also received credit on the shooting script, though his writing credit was removed from the main titles, along with Bromfield's and Murphy's. We can safely assume that it was Garrett Fort to whom we owe most of our thanks for Dracula. He was also the main screenwriting force behind Universal's Frankenstein, as well as Dracula's daughter in 1936. Because Dracula was a transitional film, reflecting the late silent era as much as the early talkies, it presented special problems to the studio. Many theaters in early 1931 were still not wired for sound. The foreign market, especially Spanish-speaking countries, were eager for talkies, but they wanted to hear actors speaking in their native language. Dubbing in those days was considered cheating. Benfield, you're compelling me to put you in a straitjacket. You forget, Doctor, that madmen have great strength. Dracula has great strength. Words, words, words. Oh, Another Shakespearean quotation, this time from Hamlet, Act Two, as Hamlet feigns madness to Polonius. Yes, sir. At once, sir. Dracula was produced in three separate versions. The Browning Lugosi talkie, of course, but also an intertitled silent version for theaters still without sound capability. In our documentary supplement, we've recreated a short scene from the silent version, following Universal's original cutting continuity. But by doing them. Doing them? By making them happen. As impressive as the scene Renfield describes would have been on screen, it would have been impossible from a practical standpoint. Rats were simply considered, quote, bad theater, unquote, by industry censors. And I could see that there were thousands of rats with their eyes. You'll note that those creatures scurrying about the Castle Dracula crypts weren't rats at all, but opossums. More biblical references here. In St. Matthew, chapter 4, Satan takes Christ into the wilderness and tempts him with glorious visions of the material world. Quote, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Unquote. By offering blood communion as a means to physical immortality, Dracula perversely takes on aspects of both Satan and Christ. All these will I give you, if you will obey me. What did he want you to do? that which has already been done. <laughs> it is actually not clear at all what Renfield is doing for Dracula. In the novel, he serves as a kind of psychic informer for the vampire on doings within the sanitarium. In traditional folklore, a vampire requires an invitation to enter a house, and the weak-minded Renfield is happy to make the overture. But in the stage and film versions, unlike the book, Dracula himself is quite adept at soliciting social calls. Van Helsing. Now that you have learned what you have learned, it would be well for you to return to your own country. The most intriguing variant version of Dracula is the Spanish language film, shot simultaneously at night on the same sets, but with a completely different director, cinematographer, cast, and crew. Van Helsing's dramatic confrontation with Dracula is a good demonstration of the divergent approaches taken by the English and Spanish language versions. The Spanish film follows the shooting script, building suspense while intercutting scenes of Mina's attempted vampire seduction of Harker, while Van Helsing attempts to resist Dracula's hypnotic commands. As you can see, Browning's version lets the sequences play independently. Both are valid cinematic techniques, but they demonstrate very different cinematic sensibilities. Many foreign language versions were produced in Hollywood during the early 30s, but the Spanish version of Dracula is unique in that it amounts to a full-fledged rival production, owing to the personalities and politics of Universal at the time. Despite Carl Lemley Jr.'s name on the main title of the Spanish film, the de facto producer of this version was Paul Koner. 
Carl Lemley Sr.'s ambitious young protege and heir apparent, until Lemley Sr. turned over the studio to his far less experienced son as a 21st birthday present. Koner was taken off the slate as producer of the English-language version of Dracula, for which he already had great plans. He had hoped that Paul Lenny, director of silent classics like Waxworks and The Cat and the Canary, would direct Dracula with Conrad Veidt as the star. Instead, Koner was relegated to producing foreign-language versions of Universal's domestic products. Meanwhile, he had fallen in love with the beautiful young Mexican ingenue, Lupita Tovar, star of Universal's Spanish version of The Cat Creeps, which he had also produced, and so effectively that Carl Lemley ordered sections of the American version reshot to match the atmosphere of the Spanish production. Koner managed to keep Tovar in Hollywood long enough to convince her to become his wife. The Spanish Dracula included in this special edition, along with a special introduction by Lupita Tovar Koner, provides a rare opportunity to compare and contrast simultaneous studio interpretations of a single script. Under Paul Koner's direction, the Spanish crew was headed by director George Melford. Melford had previously directed Rudolf Valentino as the Sheik, effective preparation, perhaps, for the Spanish Dracula, a Latin lover if there ever was. Koner, Melford, and cinematographer George Robinson reviewed Todd Browning's dailies and obsessively made their own improvements. The actors, however, were not permitted to view the rushes, except for Carlos Villarias as Dracula, whom the studio wanted to appear as Lugosi-like as possible. Villarias' name was shortened to Carlos Villar on the main titles, and his contract for the film was further changed and Americanized to Charles Villar. You can also spot him, once again in formal attire, in the opening scenes of Border Town with Betty Davis and Paul Muni in 1935. Todd Browning was reportedly furious over being upstaged by Koner's production, but the Spanish film undeniably displays more technical sophistication than Browning's film does. It does lack the odd poetry of Lugosi's majestic presence and unforgettable line readings, but visually often seems years ahead of its time. The overall effect is aided immeasurably by the quality of the master element, based on Universal's nearly pristine nitrate negative, save for the third reel which had deteriorated beyond recovery and was replaced by a worn, multi-generational show print found in Havana. Nitrate was a very unstable film stock, but its high silver content produced an extraordinary image, difficult to reproduce on safety film. Notice in the Spanish Dracula the deep, velvety blacks and crystalline highlights evident everywhere throughout the film. Notice the special care given to lighting, especially the backlighting of spider webs and mist. Notice shots cut from the Browning film, including an extraordinary glass shot of Carfax Abbey, perched on a cliff above a pounding sea. Notice George Robinson's use of the moving camera, inspired no doubt by Carl Freund, but often eclipsing their inspiration. And notice how many times Lugosi himself appears in long shots and medium long shots. Outtakes, not duplicates, from the Browning film. Lupita Tovar's negligees are much more revealing than those of Helen Chandler, and the rats are real not stand-in opossums. Universal didn't have to worry about typical censor concerns for its non-domestic product. The Spanish film was produced at the amazing cost of $66,000, as compared to the $341,000 lavished on the English-language film. The English-language Dracula was premiered at New York's Roxy Theater on February 12, 1931. An oft-repeated story suggesting a Valentine's Day tie-in is without basis. The initial advertising campaign traded instead on the bogus moving back of the premiere from Friday the 13th. The film was a surprise hit across the country and contributed materially to Universal's having its only profitable year during the Great Depression. You will what? According to David Manners, neither he or his co-star Helen Chandler took the filming of Dracula very seriously and had to stifle laughter throughout the production. And there once more is the Carl Freund memorial piece of cardboard, which nobody in the film ever seems to notice. That funny little old professor. He has a crucifix. Now I want you to get it away from you. David Manners told me that Lugosi was particularly aloof and unapproachable, wrapped up in the Dracula mystique the way he was wrapped up in his Dracula cape, walking in front of a full-length mirror, intoning to himself, I am Dracula, over and over. David insisted that he had never even bothered to see Dracula, but I'm not sure I really believed him. 
He was, in any case, flabbergasted at the fan mail he continued to receive more than 60 years after the film's release. I hope I'm not making him out to be a curmudgeon because he was an elegant, accomplished, and very charming man. But he never understood why, with all the things he had done in his long and creative life, people only seemed to want to talk to him about Dracula. What's the idea? You gone crazy? You trying to do frighten her to death? No, I was trying to save her. Save her? That's a fine way. It's all right, darling. One of the more lurid passages in Stoker's novel involved Dracula feeding blood from a wound in his chest to Mina Harker as a mystical, quasi-sexual sacrament. Not surprisingly, Helen Chandler only describes the action, rather as Renfield described the rats. Even Hamilton Dean had had trouble with the British stage censors over Mina's recollections. Here's the dialogue the Lord Chamberlain's office considered beyond the pale. Quote, I screamed out and fell on the floor. I can remember his bending over me and, oh my God, pity me, he placed his reeking lips on my throat. I have a vague memory of something very sweet all round me, and I seemed to be sinking into deep green water, and then everything went black. How long this horrible thing lasted, I don't know, but it seemed ages before I came to and saw him withdraw his awful, sneering mouth, and as I looked, it was dripping with fresh blood." Unquote. He's crazy. They're all crazy. They're all crazy except you and me. Sometimes I have me doubts about you. Yes. The most gruesome scene in Stoker's novel, The Destruction of Lucy, is not shown in the English-language version and only briefly indicated in the Spanish version. The shooting script makes matters much more clear. While Dracula is busy hypnotizing the nurse and abducting Mina, intercut is a scene of Van Helsing and Harker visiting Lucy's graveyard, and they there observe her returning to her mausoleum. Quote, As the door of the vault closes slowly with a faint creaking sound, behind Lucy and from somewhere near at hand, an owl hoots. Camera swings around to medium close shot of Harker and Van Helsing, crouched behind a nearby tombstone, and we get over Harker's reaction to Lucy's appearance, which has left him speechless and shaken. He stares at the closed door of the vault with an expression of complete stupefaction, can't credit his senses. There is a faintly pitiful look in his eyes, as if he almost suspected his own sanity. Van Helsing does not speak. He studies Harker gravely, narrowly, watching to see the effect this will have upon him, his manner paternal. One hand goes out, steadying, to Harker's trembling shoulder. For the first time we see that Van Helsing is carrying an oblong, paper-wrapped parcel. He indicates parcel, pointing to vault, and says gravely, I would have spared you this, but I wanted you to see for yourself. End quote. The script cuts back to Dracula's abduction of Mina, returning to a medium-long shot of the churchyard, Lucy's vault in the foreground. Quote, Through the open door there comes the sound of a heavy blow being struck, followed by a piercing, unearthly scream. An owl, disturbed by the sound, flutters across the scene. For a moment there is absolute silence, then slowly the figure of Harker appears. A ghastly, stricken look on his face. He emerges and leans limply against the door of the vault, head bowed, body sagging. Van Helsing follows after a moment, backing out, his eyes looking back into the darkness of the vault. Van Helsing, quote, Driving that stake in her heart was an act of mercy. May her soul rest in peace. End quote. For both Todd Browning and Bela Lugosi, Dracula was a problematic milestone. It would be the most commercially successful film either man would ever make, and yet for both of them it was a high point that would never be repeated. Browning made one more film for Universal than returned to MGM, where he produced Freaks, which Irving Thalberg intended as the ultimate horror film, but it was a commercial disaster. No other hits followed for Browning, though his 1935 Mark of the Vampire proved an atmospheric homage to his earlier triumphs, featuring Lugosi as a cloaked vampire bearing an uncanny resemblance to a certain Count You-Know-Who. Tired of studio politics, he directed his last picture, Miracles for Sale, in 1939, and then retired to Malibu and lived a comfortable, if reclusive, existence until his death in 1962. Due in part to the indelible impression he made with the role, 
Bela Lugosi never escaped the shadow of Dracula, although he played the role on screen only one more time in the 1948 comedy Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. His heavy accent hampered him, and his star in Hollywood was soon eclipsed by Boris Karloff's, who, by the time of Frankenstein's release at the end of 1931, was the new, new Lon Chaney. Off-screen and on, Lugosi looked and sounded like Dracula. It was his own face, after all, his own voice, that he had given to the part, not the creation of the makeup department. In rare films like Son of Frankenstein in 1939, Lugosi was able to show his true versatility as a character actor, but these were only the exceptions that proved the typecasting rule. A long-standing medical addiction to painkillers became tabloid news in 1955 when Lugosi publicly sought treatment. A few years later, when Dracula would be released to television and discovered by a new generation of fans, he might have had a twilight revival of his career. But he died on August 16, 1956, taking one of his beloved Dracula capes to the grave with him. In the novel, the destruction of Dracula took place after an exciting sea and land chase back to Transylvania. Just before sunset, and just before reaching his castle, his earth box is thrown from a gypsy's wagon and pried open by Jonathan Harker and his fatally wounded American compatriot, Quincy Morris. According to Mina Harker, quote, I saw the Count lying with the box upon the earth, some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible, vindictive look, which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it tear through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle. But before our eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I shall be glad as long as I live that even in that moment of final dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. End quote. In the motion picture Nosferatu, Dracula was destroyed by the first rays of sunlight, which would have been a novel concept to Stoker since his Dracula walked around London in broad daylight. In the first stage version, Dracula was stabbed through the heart and evaporated into dust with the aid of a trick coffin built on the principles of a magician's disappearing cabinet. For the Broadway version, a wooden stake was substituted for the knife. But the New York Times critic Brooke Atkinson complained that, quote, they kill him with one blow on a stake driven through his heart. Several additional blows, given with a hearty grunt or two, would seem to be a good deal more conclusive. Count Dracula deserves a steam hammer, unquote. He is not here. Then, then she may be alive. Unfortunately, Hollywood censors did not agree with Atkinson, and most of Dracula's death groans went unheard for nearly 60 years, until Universal finally restored them on Laserdisc. As the actors took their bows during the curtain call of the stage version of Dracula, it was customary for Professor Van Helsing to step forward, raising his hand to stop the applause and deliver a special message. Original cast member Ivan Butler told me that provincial audiences, familiar with the speech from repeated touring, eventually recited it aloud, as in a 1920s version of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was included in the original release of the film as well, but soon after the censors demanded its removal, fearful that it might offend religious groups by encouraging a belief in the supernatural. So, to get a better idea of exactly what Professor Van Helsing had to say, I suggest you visit our documentary supplement, The Road to Dracula, where we've done our best to recreate this lost cinematic moment. This is David Skull, and this was Dracula. <laughs>